What do you do when you're about to go talk to your boss and you feel afraid? What do you do when you have to get on a plane and you're actually terrified of flying? What do you do if you got to give a presentation and you are afraid of public speaking? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to use a strategy, the same one that I use, that has helped me beat every single fear and turned me into somebody that is terrific when it comes to a high stress situation. This is how you do it. You know, I've heard a lot of experts say that fear isn't real. That is such a bunch of baloney. Fear is so real. In fact, there are probably things that you're afraid of doing right now in your life, in your relationships, at work. And the fact that you're afraid, that's robbing you of all of the experiences that you want to have in your life. I mean, if you're afraid to fly, that's going to limit your ability to travel and see the world or go visit friends. If you're afraid of public speaking, that's going to really limit your ability to express yourself and share your ideas. If you're afraid of talking to your boss or asking for a raise, that directly impacts how much money you make. Or what if you are dreaming of starting a business or you've already started a new business, but you're afraid to talk to people and you're afraid to share your business with people. I mean, fear is something that stops us all. And that's why I'm here to talk to you because it doesn't have to. Fear is real, but I am going to share a secret weapon that I have used for years to beat every single fear that used to stop me. Now, first, before we get into this secret weapon, I just want to cover a few facts about fear, what it is, what it isn't, and some things that you may not know about fear. So first thing, fear is a physical state in your body that is exactly the same as excitement. Let me say that again. Fear and excitement are the exact same physical state. Your heart races. You might sweat a little bit. You might feel tightening in your chest. You might feel a pit in your stomach. Uh, you have a surge of cortisol. It's basically the way that your body goes into a hyper aware state because it's readying for action. Now, what's the difference between fear and excitement? Really simple. The only difference between fear and excitement is what your brain is doing as your body is all agitated. If you're excited, your brain's going, oh, wow, this is going to be so cool to ride this roller coaster. If you're afraid, your brain's going, oh, uh, uh, no way. There's no way I'm doing that. This is dangerous. Get out of there. Don't do that. It's saying something different. So what's critical about understanding this is that we're going to use the fact that your mind is either working for you for excitement or against you with fear to your advantage. And I'll tell you about it in just a minute, how you're going to do that. Second thing I want you to understand is that you may have heard the advice, feel the fear and do it anyway. You may have heard the advice, oh, just try to calm down. Think positive thoughts. It doesn't work, does it? And there's a reason why it doesn't work. So let's go back to fact number one. When you're afraid, your body's in a state of arousal and agitation and your heart is racing and you're all like amped up and you're hyper aware of what's going on and you're freaking out a little bit. What is it like when you're calm? <sighs> you just kind of chill, right? You got like this low arousal state. Very, very difficult to go from a state of agitation and being all jacked up and excited and weirded out and, uh, to a ah, kind of state. It doesn't work. It's like trying to stop a train by throwing a boulder on the tracks. It's going to make the train jump off the tracks. It's going to cause a disaster. In fact, they've proven in research that when you try to ignore your fears, it actually makes them worse. And they've also proven in research that positive thinking alone also can make your fears work worse. So what do you do? What do you do when you're about to go talk to your boss and you feel afraid? What do you do when you have to get on a plane and you're actually terrified of flying? What do you do if you got to give a presentation and you are afraid of public speaking? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to use a strategy, the same one that I use, that has helped me beat every single fear and turned me into somebody that is terrific when it comes to a high stress situation. This is how you do it. You're going to use my five second rule in combination with what I call an anchor thought 
And that is going to reframe what your mind is doing so that your mind goes from feeling agitation and making you afraid to reframing it from agitation to excitement. It works like magic. Now, I have used this technique for years, literally for years. And one of the ways that I want to introduce you to it is I want to take you backstage. I want to take you backstage to a speech that I delivered this year. And what you're going to see is you're going to see me behind, you know, the major set. I'm about to walk out. You can kind of hear the crowd roaring. My introductory video is playing. My body is in a state of arousal. I am literally, my heart is racing. My arms are sweating. Like it's like, you're going to see this. I'm going to tell you about it. And you're going to watch me use this same technique. I'm going to teach you to reframe my nerves into excitement. Check this out. All right, I'm about to go on stage. There are 7,000 people out there and it's so exciting because what they don't know is they're about to learn the five second rule and their lives will never be the same again. Now, I gotta tell you, my heart is racing. Um, my armpits are sweating. I have the exact same physiological feeling as when I'm afraid, but I'm not afraid. I'm excited. Excitement and fear is the exact same thing in your body. It's just what your brain calls it. Here's a trick that's proven by science that I use every time I speak. When I start to sweat, when I start to have butterflies, when I start to have my heart race, I say, I'm excited. I'm excited to get out there. I'm excited to talk to these people. I'm excited to share the five second rule. And what that does is it sends a message to my brain that tells my brain why my body's all agitated and excited. And that way, I don't feel afraid. Remember, excitement and fear, exact same thing in your body. The only difference is what your brain calls it. Go get them. Now, I wanna give you one more example, just to make sure that you really get how you can use this. So a lot of you have written to me about your fear of flying. And I can really relate to that fear because I used to have the exact same fear. But I use this same strategy to conquer it. Here's how you're going to do it. So first things first, if you've got to do something that really makes you nervous or that you're afraid to do, before you're about to do it, come up with an anchor thought. What's an anchor thought? Well, an anchor thought is something that's going to anchor you so that you don't escalate any situation into a full-blown panic attack or into a situation where you screw things up. It's a way for you to anchor yourself so you maintain control over what you're thinking and how you behave. So here's an example with flying. It's important when you're creating an anchor thought to pick something that is in the proper context of what you're afraid to do. So for flying, pick an anchor thought that has to do with the trip that you're taking. So if I'm boarding a plane to fly back home to Michigan, an anchor thought might be a picture in my mind of my mom and I walking on the shores of Lake Michigan where I grew up. That's a thought that makes me happy, it makes me excited, and it's also related to the trip that I'm taking. If you have a conversation that you need to have with your boss, pick an anchor thought about how you feel after having that conversation. Maybe it's you picking up the phone and calling somebody that you, you love and saying, oh my gosh, it went so well. Or you, know, you walking out of the meeting and feeling like, yeah, I survived that conversation. I feel pretty good about myself. So now that you have your anchor thought, you're ready to beat the fear. How you're gonna do it is this. So let's go back to the example of the plane. I'm on the plane, I'm flying to Michigan. We hit turbulence. My body's gonna start getting agitated, right? I'm starting to get nervous, my heart starts to race. One of two things can happen. I can't control how my body might feel, but I can always, always control what I'm thinking about, and I can always control how I act, and so can you. So when I'm on a plane and the turbulence hits, five, four, three, two, one, that's step one, and it's essential. And the reason why using the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one is essential is because that is how you switch the gears in your mind, you awaken your prefrontal cortex, and you trigger your brain that you're now in control of your thoughts. You've interrupted the fear, you've settled your thoughts, and now your brain is ready for that anchor thought. So then what I do after I go five, four, three, two, one, is I insert the anchor thought that I've already come up with before the flight. I start thinking about walking on the beach 
and being with my mom and my dad. And I start telling myself, I'm so excited to walk on the shores of Lake Michigan. I'm so excited to see my parents. Now something remarkable is gonna happen in your brain. Because you've interrupted the fear, and because you've used the five second rule to assert control and awaken your prefrontal cortex, and because you have an image that contextually makes sense to your brain because you're flying to Michigan, you know what your brain does? Your brain goes, huh, Mel's excited to go to Michigan because my body is in a state, remember the first fact? Fear and excitement, exact same thing. What's the difference between fear and excitement? What your brain is saying. Using the five second rule and an anchor thought, you can actually switch the gears in your mind and reframe the thoughts of fear into thoughts of excitement. And because you have a vision that makes sense based on what you're doing, your brain buys it. You just tricked your brain. Now Dana used this technique. She says she's never been so calm when she's been flying. And Sarah used it too. Now Sarah wrote us, she was petrified of flying, but utilizing the five second rule in five, four, three, two, one with an anchor thought, check out this photo of her on a helicopter tour in Hawaii. Not only was the tour amazing, but here's what's really amazing. If fear stops you, this will change your life. And for those of you that are afraid of public speaking, check out this photo of Carol. She also had a fear of public speaking. And by using this technique that I've just explained to you, five second rule, anchor thought, reframe your thoughts from fear to excitement, something incredible happened. She was able to beat her fear and give a speech to her nursing colleagues. And that was something that was a life goal and also something she checked off her bucket list. Fear is real. You can't control the feelings that are gonna rise up in your body when you're on a plane or when you're talking to your boss or when you see somebody that's attractive and you, you really wanna go over and, and talk to that person. But you can always control what you think and you can always make a decision about the actions you're gonna take. So the next time you feel afraid, five, four, three, two, one, go to that anchor thought, tell yourself you're excited, and that, my friend, is the power of how you beat fear in five seconds flat. Jenny is flying to LA to do three photo shoots and she was just sharing that she was a little nervous. And why are you nervous about getting on a plane and flying to LA? Uh, I always get a little nervous before flying. I just, I, I get a little bit afraid, like nervous leaving my kids and that everything's gonna get done and then I'll be okay on the plane. And I start to go through the to-do list of things I might've forgotten. But are you worried about things not getting done or are you worried about dying in a plane? Uh, dying in a plane. <laughs> Let's be honest. We're all worried when we fly dying about in dying in a plane. And I'll confess something. Even though I fly all the time, um, like literally some years more than 120 flights a year. Oh my God. Whenever I get on a plane, I always think about whether or not the plane is gonna go down. And I get very nervous when Chris and I fly together. Right. Because I think about what happens if something happens to Chris and I and you know our kids. Well, so here's one thing. I, I kind of get pragmatic and I go, well, I'm not gonna be there, so I'm not right. gonna have to deal with it. But that's <laughs> not gonna help you. So I wanna give you a little trick. Because okay. this is what has really helped me get over the fear of flying over all these years. So here's the trick. Before you do your trip, I want you to come up with one vision of what's one thing you're excited to do the whole week that you're out in LA mm -hmm. shooting for those three clients. What's the what's the vision of the thing you're the uh, most excited about? Describe honestly, it. I mean, I'm excited about the shoots, but I'm more excited about having creative space for myself. Describe what that looks like. Describe the place you're gonna uh, be in. I'm gonna be in a bungalow in Topanga by myself with this like cute little boho haven with my journal, my books, my computer, just dreaming up the dream. Fabulous, okay, great. So, now that you have a specific vision, you're gonna start using it now. Because I know that the fear of flying doesn't just happen when you're on the plane, it's already kicked in, yeah. isn't it? Right, okay, so every time you feel yourself- 24 hours of my kids left. <laughs> 24 hours of my children. I gotta be the best mother ever because if I die, I want these memories to be incredible. So when you feel yourself getting nervous, I want you to immediately 
envision yourself in that bungalow. Mm -hmm. Envision yourself in that space. Mm. She's taking a deep breath, right? And then yeah. you're gonna say these words and it's really important that you say these words. I'm so excited. I'm so excited I'm to so be excited. in that space with that creative freedom. I can see the bung, I'm so excited to have that. Mm. And what happens when you say I'm so excited is you take the nervous anxiety energy and instead of fighting, resisting, and letting it take over, you actually kind of channel and steer it toward a different emotion, which is excitement. Mm -hmm. And in your body, there's no difference between a nervous feeling and an excited feeling. So mm -hmm. it's a simple trick that has profound science behind it. They studied mm -hmm. this at Harvard Medical School and Harvard Business School. It's incredible. It's called reframing performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. So if you say, I'm so excited, you have a specific vision, you trick your mind into thinking about the bungalow and your body settles immediately. Wow, cool. And so you might have to use it 37 times on the five hour <laughs> flight to LA. You might use it 72 times between now and when you get on that plane. Yeah. But it will, I'm not kidding you, allow you to take control of your body, take control of your mind, let that spirit inside you soar. Mm -hmm. I call this like mind, body, spirit, confidence. Yeah. And this is a little trick. I'm so excited with the vision. And then when you're coming home, come up with a corresponding thing mm -hmm. about what you're super excited to do mm -hmm. when you get home. And then every time you feel slightly nervous when you're on the plane, I'm so excited to pull into the driveway and have the kids run out. I'm so excited to look at my, like whatever it is, okay? okay. Got it? How do you feel? Good. Excited. <laughs> oh, good. Let me know how that works for you too. Because we're all afraid of flying. Come on. We're all afraid to die. We're all afraid to go down in a plane. But you can, the fear, the fear is normal and real, but you have the power to use uh, body, mind, spirit, confidence to steer the fear and nerves into excitement for what you're about to go do. Wow. Good morning. I'm talking quietly because my daughter's sleeping. I woke up this morning and I was feeling really anxious. And what that means for me is the second that I wake up, my heart is racing and I start feeling like something's wrong. And I know this feeling because I've had anxiety for decades. It doesn't come around that much anymore, but when it does, oof, it takes me right back. So I wanted to just grab the phone and show you what I do when I wake up feeling anxious. First of all, rule number one, do not under any circumstances lay in bed if you wake up and you feel anxious about something. You have got to use the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, get up, get out of bed, get moving. Cause if you can get up, you can get going. If you can get going, you can get dressed. If you can get dressed, you can move your body. If you can move your body, you can then move your emotions. If you can move your emotions, you can then move your mind. If you can move your mind, you can move your mood. So one thing leads to another. Number one, get up. But rule number two is remind yourself that you're okay. Talk back to the anxiety. Why was I feeling anxious? Well, I was feeling a little anxious because I'm out here in Los Angeles to move our daughter back into her sophomore year of college. And I'm gonna miss her. I'm flying home today and I'm just sad. I'm sad that I'm leaving her. And all goodbyes, all transitions always bring up this sort of fear and this unsteadiness in me because your anxiety is gonna get worse if you allow yourself to keep thinking the negative thought. I just kept saying, I'm safe, she's safe, we're okay. Um, it's okay to be sad, you're gonna see her in a couple months. And the anxiety started to disappear. Third step, I want you to get your exercise clothes on. That's right, once you get up and you get going, get your exercise clothes on. Um, the next thing you're gonna do, make your bed. I'm gonna do that as soon as I'm done making this video. She's still sleeping. I'll still make my side of the bed even though she's in that bed because I make my bed for myself. It's a little promise I keep. Um, when I make my bed, I give myself a gift because I will be lying down in it and uh, it has a beautiful, gives me a beautiful place to dream tonight. And even though I'm in a hotel right now, I'm still gonna make my bed because it's a habit. And habits are really amazing 
patterns to create in your life. And the thing about a good habit is it creates a solid foundation for you. So by making the bed, I am uh, showing myself that the pattern that I normally go through is right here, even in a moment of anxiety. Now, what am I gonna do after I'm gonna move my body? Now, I don't have a yoga mat in this hotel room. That's all right. I'm gonna come right over here to this wood floor and I'm gonna do some yoga right here because moving my body moves the anxiety out. And then I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna move my mind. And this is the final thing. The way that I move my mind is I typically use the five second journal. But this morning, the way I'm gonna move my mind is I'm gonna do a brain dump and I'm just gonna pull out a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be fancy. I'm probably gonna use this piece of paper right here. And I'm going to write down every single thing that is on my mind. You don't have to let anxiety hijack you. You can meet those moments, whether those moments are moments when you wake up first thing in the morning and you feel anxious like I did this morning here in Los Angeles, or whether it's anxiety that comes at night or the anxiety that sort of is your companion right now during the day. Anxiety is a normal part of life. And by having a simple process for meeting it and not reacting to it, but responding to it, you will see a profound difference in your ability to move through your life and face the roadblocks and obstacles that life throws at you and just keep rolling down the highway. It's an amazing skill. Hey, it's Mel. And I wanted to talk to you this morning about two topics, anxiety and emotional flexibility. Um, you know, I struggled with anxiety for 25 years and I thought it was in the rearview mirror. I haven't had a panic attack, a bout of anxiety, anything really for about five years. And boy, I woke up this morning and there it was. And I think the fact that I woke up feeling so anxious, first of all, is really scary. Um, for me, anxiety would always come in the morning and it feels like dread and then it immediately for me feels like I can't do this I can't do this and the this that I'm referring to is everything so I want to talk a little bit about what I'm doing to handle my anxiety and about the importance of emotional flexibility so as you can see I am up here in Vermont it's absolutely stunning no reason to feel anxious up here um, and that's another thing about anxiety is we make ourselves wrong when we feel anxious. And I just did that. So here's why I'm feeling anxious. I came up here with my family because we've been quarantining outside of Boston for five weeks and thankfully everybody's safe and healthy. And we came up to my husband's family's house up here in Vermont, um, a place that I love because we thought a change of scenery would be super helpful for our psyche. And we've been here for two nights and I woke up this morning and I felt so far away from my normal life that it scared the hell out of me. You know, I'm physically far away and it was a reminder of just how far away emotionally I feel from it and how much I actually am struggling, how I'm struggling to stay focused, how I'm struggling to work on my own, how I'm struggling to work remote, how I'm struggling to not be around so many people. And I think all of that came together and hit me this morning in the form of anxiety. Now, for me, anxiety is really suffocating causes me to panic. It makes me want to run. And so here's some things that I've been doing this morning to work through it. First of all, there's two ways I'm going to talk about emotional flexibility. One is, is being flexible with yourself so that when you feel something that's uncomfortable, that you're flexible enough 
to give yourself space to feel it because pushing it down, denying it, making yourself wrong, it's only going to make that negative feeling grow. It's going to make that anxiety eat you alive. And so I recognize that it was there. And what I do is I immediately say something. So my husband was next to me and I said something to Chris and he just listened. And he demonstrated emotional flexibility because he didn't make me wrong. He didn't try to fix it. He just let me have my reality, even though it's not what he's feeling. The next thing I did is I just got out a computer and I just started writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and dumping and dumping. And that helped a little bit. And so then I texted three friends. I texted um, Lisa and Gretchen and Mindy and said, I am really anxious right now and I'm struggling. And saying that and going back and forth on text with uh, them was a little helpful. And then I started to pace around the house because that's what anxiety makes me do. I start to feel like a caged animal. And Chris said, we should go for a hike. And honestly, the thought of climbing a mountain right now makes me want to die. <laughs> so I said no. Um, I didn't want to exert anything. I just know I need to move. And so instead, I'm going to go walk down the valley and do this five-mile loop that I really don't feel like doing. But I know I need to because I know that anxiety gets stored in my nervous system. It's triggered by my nervous system that everything right now feels far away from the life that I was living and the life that you were living. And that's why I'm so anxious right now. And so I'm going to move my body and move it out of my body. And then I am going to just practice having emotional flexibility and allowing the feelings to rise and fall and not do anything about it. So if you're experiencing anxiety for the first time, or if your normal anxiety has been jacked way up, or if it's coming back like it is for me, please be patient with yourself. Take deep breaths, get outside and walk, and by all means, be talking to your friends and family about what you're feeling because stored in here, it'll eat you alive. But when you start to speak about it and you start to move it through your body, you will move it out of your body and you will feel better. I know in an hour and a half when I'm done with this walk, I will feel a hundred times better. And I know if you pick up the phone and call somebody or you start journaling or you put on an exercise video and you move, you will move this through your nervous system and you will feel back in control. I promise, I promise, I promise. I can't promise that it won't come back, but I can promise that you can make it disappear by taking those steps. I wanted to respond to a bunch of your comments about a video that I put up yesterday that went crazy. Um, and it was a video that I shot a couple days ago over the weekend because I woke up and I had an anxiety attack, something I hadn't had in about six years. And I decided to film myself in the middle of processing the anxiety and share with you what I was going to do to lower it. And I did that because, first of all, I think it's really important that you know that I'm not just reading this in a book that everything I share with you or that I teach in the online courses that we have, that it is uh, research-backed tools and strategies that I use in my own life. And I was so touched by all your comments and all your concern, and I want you to know that I feel great, I'm grounded, I'm really good. The anxiety lasted about an hour and then I moved through it and I think everybody is facing some level of anxiety right now 
And if you're not, you should probably turn inward and re-examine how you're feeling because anxiety is a very normal response to this extremely abnormal situation that we're in. But I wanted to unpack the topic of anxiety just a little bit more because so many of you are feeling it and you had a lot of really great questions about it. So first things first, anxiety is something that I've suffered for 25 years. I haven't really experienced any in the last six years because I've done a ton of work on my mindset, on grounding myself, on understanding uh, the mind-body connection and the difference between being and doing. And anxiety is a patterned response to uncertainty. And there's kind of two different forms of anxiety responses. And understanding the two different forms helps you to spot it. The two forms of anxiety are over-functioning and under-functioning. Now, neither one is better or worse. They're just patterns. And the cool thing with patterns is once you can spot them and talk about them and you understand them and unpack them, you can start to create mindfulness and a little bit of distance between the things that trigger your anxiety and that coping mechanism kicking in. Because for me, when I get into the mode of do, 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 plan, 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 I got it, I got it, I got it, I drive myself into the ground. I burn out. And that's exactly what happened this weekend. Six weeks of basically going into hyperdrive mode as a way to cope with all this uncertainty led me to crash because I'm terrible at asking for help. And my husband, I'll have to ask him how he copes with his anxiety because he has a really amazing way of staying calm. If I start getting anxious, like I did on Sunday, or I have throughout our 24 year marriage, what do you do? Because you have this superpower of being able to remain calm. And the thing that I find the most validating is even though you don't feel anxious, you are able to validate my reality of being anxious, even though you're not in the same reality. Touch is huge, right? What do you mean so touch? Meaning being able to hold your hand or being close and upfront and personal to what you're experiencing, just pulling what you're feeling out of your mouth. Like that, that act of inviting you to describe what's going on, to give detail to it, and to almost not let up, to keep like pulling a thread, like what else is going on? What else is there? What else are you feeling? And I think maybe part of the reason why I don't get triggered by it in that moment is because I've seen it work so effectively that once you get it all out, it's like barfing, it's, it dissipates. It may not just extinguish itself, but it will, it will go away. So technique number one is to give somebody a hug or hold their hand, center them with physical touch. Yeah. Okay. Sit up close in front of them make sure that you have the icon you know as much eye contact as you can have physically with that person and then the <laughs> second thing you do is give people the questions that you might start asking the person in your life that's feeling anxious well i would start with tell me about your anxiety right now what are you feeling what's happening not only physically in your body but of course, emotionally, I mean, those are the two main pillars. Is... And then you keep going and anything else. And, and he does that over until I'm literally like the tank is completely empty. You know what else I've noticed? And I think this is a really important thing is that you don't respond to what comes out of my mouth. 
no answers. You cannot provide any direction or guidance or um, go for the solve. Why? Because there is no solve, particularly when you're in the acute moment. There is no, nothing is going to resolve that right there and then, even if you have the most best, you know, idea ever. What is it that you've observed when you get somebody back to zero and in the moment? What do you observe in the person? People coming back to right now and how that is in and of itself is such a powerful grounding mechanism. When you're right here, you're you are out of you're you're out of your head. You're not thinking about yesterday or tomorrow or wherever the source of that anxiety may be coming from. Mm. You're present to your physical space and surroundings and that I think has it must I, I know it, it has a profound effect on calming it not necessarily extinguishing it but certainly calming it. i think that's your superpower i really do like i you are the most grounded calm person in my life so over functioning anxiety is do 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 it's a giving advice instead of asking for help it's assuming responsibility for things that aren't necessarily your responsibility it's managing everybody else's emotions. And I am the master at this. And the other form of anxiety is underperforming. And as I was thinking about this, one of my three kids has this form and I never would have thought it given their personality. Underperforming is when instead of thinking through your issues, you start asking for tons of advice. You push the responsibility to other people to solve your issues. You withdraw, you become paralyzed. And the reason why it's important to really think about what kind of anxiety you have, and what I want you to do is, in the comments, I want you to write down, are you a over-functioning, over-performing anxiety person? Or are you a under-functioning, under-performing? And what happens when you are over-functioning is I rob the people around me of supporting me, of being responsible for themselves, of helping out. I rob myself of the support that I need and deserve. And if you stay in the pattern too long, of either under or over functioning, you will drive yourself into the ground. Again, you gotta express these emotions because burying them has never worked in the history of time. And so what I want you to do is again, write in the comments, what is your pattern when you feel anxious? Do you over function or under function? And the solution today is very simple. I just want you to recognize the pattern. And for you over-functioners, when you recognize yourself going into that mode, take a pause, get into your body, ask yourself, what do I need help with? And who can I ask for help? And what am I taking on that I don't need to take on? And how can I get myself into this moment and ground yourself? And if you are an under-functioner, same thing. Recognize when you're spinning and asking for advice or overthinking or paralyzed instead of problem solving and getting into action. Um, I hope that helps. I'm so glad I got to take you on the walk with me and YOLO! And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. A few weeks ago, Kendall interrupted me while I was on a Zoom therapy session. I'm trying to train you that when I'm on a Zoom call, that you're going to get filmed. <laughs> this will work. <laughs> and um, after she left the room, 
I told my therapist, she does this to me a lot. I'll tell her that I'm going to be in a meeting for an hour and 25 minutes into the meeting, she comes into the office. She asks me something very inconsequential that doesn't really matter. Like, when are we having dinner? Or do you know where this is? Something that could have waited. And it kind of frustrates me. It drives me crazy. And my therapist told me, oh, well, that's a classic thing that people do. It's called borrowing functioning. And I'm like, what? I'd never heard of it. Had you ever heard of it? And... It's when you feel a moment of anxiety or boredom or some uncomfortable feeling. And instead of being able to just ground yourself down and give yourself the soothing or the support that you need, you borrow that functioning that you don't have for yourself by going to somebody else. So by interrupting me in a moment where maybe she felt a little insecure, a little bored, a little distracted, maybe you wanted to procrastinate. Instead of giving herself what she needed to get back on track, she finds somebody else to give her what she needs. She's seeking a little reassurance. She's seeking to be told everything's okay. Is that right? Yeah, some of the times. So what have you noticed since... Because I wanted to make this video because Kendall just said to me, you know, ever since that conversation we had about borrowing functioning, I noticed something. So what did you notice? I was just saying that ever since she told me that it, like, pissed her off that I would interrupt her, um, I just stopped coming. I've stopped coming up to her office during the days, at least when I know she's busy. Like, today I even opened the door and I heard her in her recording voice talking and so I was like okay I'm just gonna shut the door whereas normally I would just like come up and try to like do some signal to her or something stupid but I, I don't really understand where the psychology comes in I've just noted I've just regulated it and kind of shut it down I don't bother you as much anymore well is it that you don't bother me or is it that you've noticed that you don't didn't actually need me in that moment yeah, a, a bit of both. I mean, a lot of the times I'm just bored and I want company. And I'm like, what's up? <laughs> it's not even about being anxious necessarily. Um, well, that is kind of uh, an uncomfortable feeling to be bored and to be alone. And not knowing how to deal with boredom or being alone is why we seek a distraction. And for some people, the distraction is going and finding somebody else, which is totally fine. For other people, it might be drinking or vaping or, you know, having some weed because you want to soothe that uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I don't want you to interrupt me. Absolutely. I want you to come up here. It makes me sad to think you, do, you wouldn't come up to the office because you think that I'm too busy for you. That's not the point at all. The point is in those moments where I take the time to say, hey, I'm going to be on a phone call for an hour or I'm... Uh, doing a speech live for a, a client, knowing that in those moments, there's still the desire to check in, the desire to interrupt, the desire to... Yeah, well, also I come to you because you don't get mad. You're like, hey, what's up? Whereas like when I go interrupt dad, he's like, yes. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you say that because when it happened in therapy during that therapy call... My therapist said, well, you realize you just invited her. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, when she opened the door and said, you're busy, you said, come on in. And you're very welcoming. And I said, well, of course I was. Well, do you want me to come in and say, are you busy? Or do you not want me to come in? I think if I've told you that I need the hour, unless there's an emergency, well, I'd rather you not come in. You don't always tell me like, hey, from nine to five today, I'm going to be on and off Zoom calls. Don't come in. Like, whenever you have a speech or you have some big meeting, you text in our family group chat and you're like, don't come up. And I know. Yep. Yep. But, like, throughout the day. No, I love for you to poke your head in. And if I kind of hold up the hand, it means don't. I'm in the middle of something. Got it. And I also, when she said to me, what if you would have turned to Kendall when she opened the door and said, I told you I was going to be in a meeting for an hour. I was like, I couldn't say that to her. And she said, why? Well, I would be like, geez. <laughs> right? I'd be like, whoa, okay. I know. And uh, and she said, well, that's part of the problem, is that you're not establishing 
healthy boundaries between you two. You have allowed yourself to become the coping mechanism that she uses when there's a feeling that she's not comfortable with. And by saying, I told you I needed an hour, I'll be out in 20 minutes, it also reminds you that you can rely on yourself to get yourself through those moments of boredom. Mm. What do you think? Makes sense. I don't know if I could say that to you though, because mm. I feel like it's a rejection. Mm, it's not. You're fine. Okay, I'll try it. Well, I love you. I love you too. This is a collective issue. And if you're scared right now, if you've lost your job, if you're worried about running out of money, you're not alone. 58% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. So if you're worried about money, if you don't have the savings to see yourself through, through the end of the summer, you're not alone. You're in the majority, which is why I want to talk about this. We're going to talk about the five things I want you to do. Everybody needs to stop and accept the new normal. What does that mean? In my mind, the new normal means the end of this year. The new normal means that you want to stop and you want to assess if this is going to go on in terms of self-isolation for a couple months, which I think it probably will, and then we come out of it, it's going to take a little bit of time. Number two, I need you to face your fear and get the facts. This is the most important part. You ready? I want you to pull two months of your bank statements, print them out, and then go through them and you're gonna need two things. Get a highlighter and get a pen. Highlight all of the deductions from your account. That's gonna tell you where you're spending money and then make a list of all of those businesses. Now that you've highlighted all the deductions and you have listed all the businesses, now it is time to pick up the phone and get proactive. That's step number three. Now we're gonna go from being paralyzed to proactive. So here's what I want you to do. Anything you don't need, get rid of. If there is a subscription to something that you don't need, get rid of it. If you don't go to the gym, it is time to face reality, everybody, and figure out what apps are charging you that you didn't even realize. Is your kid's Xbox attached to your credit card? Now is the time to take control of this stuff, everybody. And now here's a really great tip for mindset. Pretend that the bills that you're looking at and the financial reality that you're looking at are either your best friends or your brother or sisters. Why? If you pretend that the bills that you're looking at or the financial reality that you're looking at is somebody else's, you leverage the power of objectivity, which means you and I could look at somebody else's bills and be like, oh my God, dude, you gotta get rid of that cable. Bill. Oh, what the hell? We would have a level of objectivity and boom, and so you can hack that in your own mind when you look at your bank statement. Don't make yourself wrong. And then say, if this were my brother, my sister, or my best friend, what tough love would I give them right now? What would I cut out? And then here's the final piece of advice. You have to check your ego at the door. This isn't happening to you. It's happening to the world. This isn't your personal crisis. This is a global crisis. And I need you to take comfort in that. Everybody is facing some level of crisis. This isn't unique to you. And inside of that is an enormous opportunity because collectively we're going through something and collectively people are rallying at a local level. And there are resources available to help you that have been launched in the last week. So this is a time to check your ego and to ask for help, whether that help is from your family or it's from your friends, or it's from your neighborhood, or it's from your local government, or it's from the local food pantry. If you've been laid off from a job and you're worried about money, not every business is, is shrinking. There are businesses that are growing. Walmart just announced that they are hiring 150,000 temporary workers. The Dollar Tree just announced they are hiring 25 thousand workers. Domino's is looking for another 10,000 people. Grocery store chains are looking for people. I want you to lower your anxiety now and know that you accepted the new normal. 
you faced your fears and got your facts straight about where you stand. You moved yourself from being paralyzed to opening those bills, to making those calls, to making those asks and being proactive. Leverage the power of objectivity. And finally, you checked your ego at the door in this moment and you asked for help or you applied for a job that you normally wouldn't apply for. That is what is gonna get you through because that is what resilient people do. You do what is necessary in the times that you are facing. When you first start using the five second rule, most people use it to get to the gym, to make sales calls, to get up on time, to have tough conversations, to do the physical stuff. Yeah. But the real mojo is to use it to rewire your mindset. Okay. And so if you're somebody that suffers from anxiety, first of all, here's what you need to know. It's not a disease, period. It's not a disease. There are people that suffer from acute anxiety disorder. They should seek professional help. There's incredible medication that works. I'm talking to the people that suffer from more general anxiety that people feel in their day-to-day -day lives right. or that are brought on by a specific situation. I'm also speaking from um, specific personal experience and the fact that we know of hundreds of thousands of people who've actually cured their anxiety right. because of what I teach. So here's what you need to understand. Anxiety always begins with a worry, always. It begins with a thought that is triggered by something. So if you suffer from anxiety, you wake up in the morning and your mind spins, you lay in bed at night and your mind spins, you walk into work and you feel anxious in your body. I want you to write down all the things that trigger you to feel anxious. Interestingly, another major trigger <clears throat> is being home or going home and that moment right before your partner walks in the door. If you feel anxious, when your partner's about to walk in or you're about to walk into your own home, that is a major signal that you are in the wrong relationship, that there is something incredibly off and you either need to get into counseling, but that is one that we hear a lot about. Wow. Um, because you're walking into a situation mm. that feels uncertain. Yeah. A lot of people, by the way, had parents that were abusive or parents that were yellers. So they also are experiencing ghosts from the childhood yeah. of it's five o'clock, dad's about to come home and pour a drink and everybody's on edge. Yeah. So write down the triggers, okay? Because having, tr having kind of the triggers ahead of time will help you come up with a plan for how you're going to catch yourself when your mind defaults to the automatic ways that it thinks. Then what I want you to write down next to the trigger is what exactly are you worried about? So having the trigger and then the, what do I worry about? I worry that my boss is gonna yell. I worry that my partner's gonna yell. I worry that I'm gonna get in trouble. I worry that um, you know my friends are gonna laugh at me. I worry that I'm gonna be a, whatever the f it may be. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna write down what I call an anchor thought. An anchor thought is something that weighs you down and it makes you excited. And so here's how the strategy works with the five second rule. The next time you're in a situation, and let's just use the example of pulling into your own driveway or your own apartment, and maybe you've got issues with your boyfriend or girlfriend or your roommate, and that makes you unsettled. You're, the second you pull in and you feel the trigger, you're gonna go five, four, three, two, one, because I wanna interrupt your mind from going into the I don't like, what, what if I do the, and then you're gonna drop in the anchor thought of the last time that you and your roommate really got along well, or the last time that you stood up for yourself and it went fine. And or you're your gonna, puppy. Yeah, or a puppy or whatever. <laughs> and you're gonna say, I'm so excited to deal with this. Yeah. And then you're going to get out of your car, even though your body is gonna feel a little unsettled and your mind's gonna race, go five, four, three, two, one, if you start to like be like, uh, but what, uh, uh, and then walk in the door. And what I'm teaching you to do is to not let your mind hijack you. Right. And it's very important because there's a very tight nexus between your habit of worrying and spiraling your thoughts and the way your body starts to amp up. And so we wanna settle your mind so we don't agitate your body. You got it? Yeah. And so if you start to practice that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and for you 18 year olds that are watching this, use this with, the nerves that you have about what you're gonna do with your life. 
use this when you catch yourself worrying about college applications because worrying about the applications won't get them done. Worrying about what your friends are doing won't make it happen. Worrying about what you're going to be doing when you're 25 or how you're going to make money, it's not going to help you make money right now. It's only going to make you miserable. Right. So five, four, three, two, one, cut off that habit. Yeah. That'll stabilize your body and then go to a vision of you at the age of 25 driving a car that you think is cool and hanging out with a friend that's cool and saying to yourself, I'm so excited because I know I'm going to figure it out. Because you don't need to worry about that right now. Yeah. But it becomes a habit that destroys your year this year.